Okay, so um, I think we should begin with this session. First, let me acknowledge our chairperson, Dr. Minakshi Swaminathan. Dr. Minakshi, are you there? Uh, yes. Welcome. Good morning. How are you, Doctor, today? I am very well, thank you. And we have a moderator for the session, Dr. Ramesh. Dr. Ramesh probably is joining us very shortly because he said he is uh, in the operation theatre. Okay, fair enough. And we have our first speaker, Dr. Minashi. You are ready with your presentation, I believe. Yes, I am just going to introduce everybody. Yeah, so I'll just and, take uh, all the speakers yeah. are present first. So do we have Dr. Jitendra Jethani? Dr. Jethani, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. Well. All well. Dr. Sumita? Hello. Yes. Good morning. Dr. Rohit? Yeah, I'm there. Dr. Shruti? Yes, she was there. Yes. Yes, I'm and here. Dr. Nina? Yes. It's a roll call. <laughs> All right. So, um, Dr. Meenakshi, over to you. The podium is all yours. All right. I have a quick question to you. Thank you so much for all for uh, you know getting the show on the road. I have a question uh, about audience questions. So, will where will I look for the audience questions? Uh, so first, you have it in your chat, okay? Mm -hmm. And and if it's not in the chat, so next to participants, there is something called as Q and A. That's right. So when you click on Q and A, when you get any kind of questions. There are two options. Either you can answer it live or you can type the answers. All right. Lovely. Thank you so much. All right. So we have 10 minutes of talk for everybody. Yes. Okay. And uh, before a minute, uh, we have a buzzer sound, which will indicate that you have to wind up. your. Yeah, this is the buzzer. So this will be an indication that you only have one minute left for your speech. And once your, once your time is up, you'll have one more buzzer. That indicates that you have to come down to the conclusion. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. So we Over start you, the session on uh, myopia control. I thank uh, Dr. Partha Bishwas was for uh, requesting me to put together the session. Uh, and uh, nothing has shown how important myopia is like the pandemic. So we have all our kids unable to go out all glued to screens of various sizes, stuck indoors. And uh, we surely all of us have seen a steady increase in myopes. And so is, this is the apt time to know from each one of you several important areas in the topic of myopia control. So we're going to start the first topic. And I, at the outset itself, I thank each one of you to have made it to just very short notice to the session and I'm immensely grateful. So we first start off with from atom to lamp, a summary of what we know about low dose atropin. And we have Dr. Nina from the Giridhar Eye Institute. Nina was our faculty in um, Shankari Trilya Kolkata as well. And uh, we're very proud of all she has been doing. Over to you, Dr. Nina. Thank you, ma'am. I hope... Uh... Your, you can see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. So from atom to lamp, what we know about low-dose atropin, that's my talk. Let me thank AOSD 2021 and Dr. Minakshi for this opportunity. So ever since myopia has become a booming epidemic, a lot of noble treatment modalities have come to control the progression of myopia in childhood. Low-dose atropin is an emerging treatment modality, which has got the fancy of many, and we'll see why and how. Why do we like atropin so much? First of all, it has been around in ophthalmology for a very long time and has been shown to be consistently effective in slowing myopia progression with a good safety profile. So there have been a multitude of studies uh, you know, in this regard, but it was a landmark study called the ATOM, Atropin for the Treatment of Childhood Myopia by Chua et al., which was published in September 2006. Uh, which validated the efficacy and safety of topical atropin in slowing the progression of myopia in Asian children. So this was a randomized, double-masked, parallel group, placebo control study in about 400 children aged 6 to 12 years with a spherical equivalent of minus 1 to minus 6 diopters. So they looked at the uh, effect of 1% atropin drops or placebo eye drops once at bedtime for two years. And they looked at the change in spherical equivalent and axial length over two years. 
About 86.5% children completed the study and they found that in the atropine treated eyes, myopia progression was less. Axial length remained unchanged and the differences in myopia progression and axial elongation between the two groups were statistically significant. So they concluded that over two years, atropine 1% eye drops slowed myopia progression by 77% with no axial elongation. It was well tolerated and effective in slowing progression of low to moderate myopia and axial length in Asian children. However, the undesirable side effects of 1% atropine like blurry near vision, photophobia, and the risk of increased UV exposure and the need to wear uh, uh, photogray glasses and progressive lenses deterred its widespread usage. So researchers have been looking at lower concentrations and in 2016, uh, Adrichia et al. published their five-year clinical trial on atropine for the treatment of myopia, which is popularly called the ATOM2 study. So this compared the safety and efficacy of lower concentrations of atropine, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and 0.01% in myopia control. Again, it was a randomized double mass clinical trial, and they had three phases in this. Phase one was a treatment phase in which each eye received atropine for about two years. Phase two was a washout phase in which all medications were stopped for about one year. And phase three was they looked at the rebound myopia progression on stopping the drops. And if anybody had progressed beyond or equal to more than 0.5 diopter, they were restarted on 0.01% atropine eye drops for another two years. So the parameters assessed in each visit would be cycloplegic refraction, axial length, pupil size, accommodation, and visual acuity. And they looked at the change in spherical equivalent, which was analyzed as a primary outcome, and the change in axial length was uh, calculated as a secondary outcome. Again, about 86% children continued to the phase three. Surprisingly, about 56% of the children had to be restarted on atropine point, not 1% at the end of phase two. That means there was about 56% uh, children had uh, rebound, but this was least in the point, not 1% group. So that was the most interesting observation in the atom two as compared to the point, 0.1 and 0.5% groups. So they concluded that myopia progression over the entire five years was less in the 0.01% group, and the rate of myopic progression in children who were restarted on atropine 0.01% slowed in phase three, and they postulated that retreatment with atropine 0.01% was as effective as primary treatment with uh, atropine 0.01% itself. So the key points we understood from ATOM2 was that definitely there was a dose-related response to atropine in phase one with greater effect in higher doses. However, on stopping the drug in phase two, there was a rebound, inverse dose-related increase in myopia with greater increase in greater concentrations. Younger children, those with greater myopic progression in year one were more likely to require retreatment. Overall, five-year progression of myopia was less in the 0.01% group all concentrations were well tolerated with very less side effects, but it was least with the 0.01% group. So they also classified the patients based on the response. A good responder was one who had less than 0.25 adapter per year of progression. And if the child was older than 13 years, they recommended that atropine 0.01% could be stopped. Moderate response, if the progression was between 0.25 to 0.75 adapter per year, then you have to continue the atropine 0.01% till it reduces to 0.25 adapter per year progression or the child reached mid to late teens. If there was a poor response, that means myopia was progressing beyond 0.75 adapter, then atropine had to be stopped and they did not recommend any further treatment. Now, the strength of the study was obviously its large population with a long follow-up and randomized double-blinded design, but the concern was an absence of a placebo control group with which you could compare the data with. And the fact that despite 0.01% being the best uh, concentration, there was a significant axial length elongation in that group of about 0.4 millimeters at the end of two years. So uh, if you compare the ATOM1 and ATOM2, you can see that ATOM2 had slightly older age group, slightly higher levels of baseline myopia. In comparison to the ATOM1, in which there was a hyperopic shift in the initial eight months, Continued myopic progression was noted in all the groups in ATOM2 till it started to stabilize by 8 to 24 months, and there was a plateauing with maximal effect of myopia control in the second year. 
Now, a lot of unanswered questions were still there and which is the best concentration people wanted to know. So Jason Yam et al. from Hong Kong University is currently doing this quadrophasic study called LAMB, Low Dose Atropine for Myopia Progression. This is a quadrophasic study, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. Phase one and two results are out. One would be treatment phase, two is continuation, three is washout, and fourth is the extension phase. So phase one results were published in 2019. They looked at the efficacy of 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0 0.01 compared with placebo over one year. And the profile of children was similar to ATOM2, and they found that there was a concentration-dependent response to the 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0 0.01% atropine in myopia control. And they found that 0.05% atropine was the most effective in controlling progression and axial length elongation over a period of one year. They continued the study to the second year, and these results were again published as LAM2 in 2020. And uh, here, the group, group of uh, concentrations of atropine, the various groups of concentrations of atropine were continued to the second year, and the placebo group was crossed over to the best group at the end of first year, which was 0.05%. And again, they found that the mean spherical equivalent progression and axial length change was lowest for the 0.05% atropine group. So they concluded that 0.05% remained this optimal concentration among the study groups in slowing myopia progression. So to summarize the evidence for atropine would be, ATOM1 showed that atropine 1% slowed myopia progression significantly by 77% over two years with no axial length increase. ATOM2 showed that 0.01% retarded myopia progression close to 50% with least side effects and rebound, but axial length increase was a concern. LAMP showed that lower concentrations were equally good, but 0.05% was the most effective. LAMP2 confirmed the findings that 0.05% uh, was the best concentration at the end of two years with an efficacy of 64.5% with an effect double that of 0.01%. So what is this anti-myopia effect of atropine? Does it work on accommodation or does it have other effects? We know it works on the muscarinic receptors by blocking it. It inhibits the glycosaminoglycan synthesis in the spiral fibroblasts and prevents the eye growth. The increased pupillary dilatation allows entry of UV light and kind of down-regulates the axial length increase and the chronic inflammatory state of myopia. So these are some uh, postulates, but the exact effect is still to be deciphered. So uh, take home pearls would be that there is a definitely a concentration dependent response to atropine on myopia control and myopia is slow to maximum with atropine 1%, but definitely it has unpleasant side effects. Lower concentrations like 0.01 and 0.05% might have a greater effective stop signal for myopia progression in the long run with the least side effects. So you can start with the lowest available concentration 0.01% at bedtime in moderate to slow progressive myopia Monitor the treatment with cyclorefraction and axial length. Progression can happen on stopping atropine abruptly, so you may need to taper the frequency or switch over to higher doses. Age-dependent effect is noted, and younger children with early onset of myopia, rapid progression, or parental high myopia may need to be in initiated on higher doses. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. It was a very comprehensive, lovely talk. It's very hard to uh, uh, really compress so much material into the time you have, and you've finished uh, right on. And um, thank you so much for that uh, talk. We have plenty of time for discussion, even uh, from the audience or amongst ourselves, the panelists, uh, as to you know uh, uh, to take to delve into this topic a little bit more. So um, I, there's a slight switch in the order. So we're going to take up uh, the next topic will be the epidemic within the pandemic, environmental factors, genetic influences, and what to tell the parents. Over to you, Dr. Shruti Nishant. Dr. Shruti Nishant is uh, our proud Arvindan Estan alumnus, and uh, she is the pediatric ophthalmology head at the MN Eye Hospital. Over to you, Shruti. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your kind uh, invitation and for having me here. So I'm quickly going to share my slide. I hope uh, my screen is visible. Yes, ma'am, your screen is visible. Okay. Okay, so today I'm going to be uh, talking, good morning, everyone, on this very long topic, which is the epidemic within the pandemic. We're going to be discussing genetic influences, environmental uh, factors, and what to tell the parents. Um, 
I know this is a long title, so I'm going to be breaking it up into pieces, just like any other good movie buff. So we're going to be going at it part by part. So the first part is how bad of it uh, as an epidemic in itself. Myopia is right now. We're currently in the boom of a big epidemic, and we do know that by 2050, probably 4.8 billion is the number of predicted myopes. And in India, with this wonderful paper from uh, AIMS, uh, Dr. Agarwal and uh, Dr. Saxena, uh, we know that the uh, Overall, crude prevalence of myopia is going to be 7.5 percent, but it has already been proved to be uh, somewhere around 13 percent uh, in the earlier studies. Uh, this is just another uh, thing of what is the current prevalence of myopia, and this was all before Corona happened. And so we're looking at anywhere between 10 to 65 percent. But now comes Corona and walks into our lives in 2020, and then you know that you know things are going to change. so we do know that there is a certain trajectory happening and then corona might probably just bump it up and change the trajectory a little bit so what happened after corona came more than 160 countries have closed schools uh, and uh, you know children are out of school they are probably physically less active they have longer screen times and irregular uh, sleep patterns and less favorable diets and this is of course going to throw up all their fitness and their psychological effect as well uh, so post covid what exactly happened quarantine myopia is happening and in in my favorite term covidopia so what what it is is actually not much of studies is out yet but as far as what we know this is a new uh, this is a uh, original article from jama which was published which said that the prevalence of myopia in china this is a chinese study bumped up from 3.5 to 5.7% in 2015 to uh, almost 21.5 percent in 2019 so almost a 400 percent increase in 2020 for 7 and 8 year old participants this increase was also uh, considerable the first one was below 6 years of age so this this was another study where they found out that uh, during covid uh, the children tended to have more myopia but once the covid was over and they had their next 6 month review the uh, children tended to uh, go into a little bit of hyperopia and that's probably explained by the fact that they were in accommodative spasm during the time of lockdown so again food for thought not many other studies that have come in but uh, we're still waiting for good uh, studies post that now let's move on to part 2 which is myopia genetics now this is a very vast topic which is difficult to cover we're going uh, basically myopia can be of three types like syndromic high myopia which is an isolated entity and school myopia now syndromic myopia is easy to identify they're going to have features they're going to have genes associated which are mapped already high myopia as an isolated entity have been studied through linkage studies candidate gene studies and recently next gen sequencing now high myopia follows a mendelian kind of a, a pattern whereas school myopia which is a more common variant is one that is a complex disorder it's like diabetes where you have a lot of uh, uh, factors that are environmental based rather than genetic however we do have mapped certain morph polymorphisms through gwas which is uh, ge gene y uh, genetic uh, genome uh, association studies micro rna studies and gene environment interactions now this is what i was talking about syndromic myopia where you have uh, syndromic forms which have mapped genes and their patterns you have high myopia where up to now 20 myopia loci uh, have been uh, mapped and this is the timeline of how many loci have been found out so far and up to now like 131 new loci have actually been mapped for high myopia and uh, candidate gene studies are a new way of finding out uh, the pathway like how the pathogenesis of myopia happens and in this they have found out that synaptogenesis and neural connectivity form an important functional property uh, of genes that are associated with high myopia and this is a list of the genes that are associated with that now coming on to genome wide association studies which is what is a more common variant seen in school myopia these are the uh, huge number of uh, you know uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been mapped now the interesting thing here is that uh, what what gwas is basically we take up a huge number of population with myopia and we kind of study the the, the genetics that are similar in these groups and then we form the uh, the polymorphisms and we tell them that these are associated with myopia now these have been mostly done by three groups which is the cream consortium the 23 and me and the uk biobank now that is an interesting way of finding out the uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms 
The next two thing is the gene environment interactions, which is a very, very important uh, niche kind of a thing that is happening now, where they find out what environmental factor is related to genetic, uh, a genetic um, uh, link. So here they have found that high education subset uh, has been related to these kind of single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms. And another study that uh, found uh, that there was weak evidence for interaction with near work, I mean, association with 39 single nucleotide polymorphisms. But overall, we can say that the increased risk of myopia in children uh, having one myopic parent with an odds ratio of 1.87 and two myopic parents, odds ratio of 2.40. But we still don't know whether it is the genes that are at play or the similar environmental influences and the way they mimic their parents, whether that is at play and that is still out um, to, for judging. So we, from this, we know that myopia has a very dense interplay between genetics and environment. and but. It's, it's very safe to say that the genes here play a role as a bullet and the environment is the trigger. And as long as the bullet is loaded and there is no trigger, I would, most probably there's a very low chance of myopia happening. With the trigger, that's when myopia kicks in. So this was an interesting patient I had who was a high myope and he wanted to get married and he came in for genetic counseling. And this got me thinking that what, is there a role for genetic counseling in the future? Are more patients going to be coming in asking for whether they need to get their genes mapped? So because more and more of people are getting myopic, they're going to be marrying myopic people and then, you know, it's going to get propounded. So this is some food for thought and then we'll, we'll probably have to think about this uh, in the future. Now, moving on to part three, which is the environmental factors. We do know that these are all the modifiable environmental factors, outdoors, near work, diet, sleep, ambient light. And of course, there is the rural urban divide and the socioeconomic status, which we already know about. So it is safe to say that scleral remodeling forms the basic pathogenesis. And the main things that is the physiological changes that happens is the change in image quality, the mechanical strain, the acquired biochemistry. Now, image quality can be a blurred image. It can be because of poor illumination. The mechanical strain can be because of poor accom uh, excessive accommodation convergence, which causes a weakness of the muscles or because of inflammatory mediators. And the third is the poor nutrition, stress and environmental issues. And all of this coupled with the genetic factor causes this scleral remodeling. So this has been proven in studies in a mouse model where you can see that um, in, my, in uh, myopic mice, where they have done monocular form deprivation, the collagen actually decreases over 21 days. So there is actual scleral remodeling. What is the effect of outdoors? We still don't know what exactly in outdoors works, but these are all the study parameters. The brightness or the ambient light, uh, I'm sorry, it's not blue light, it's violet light. The circadian rhythm of the eyes, the accommodation, the relaxation to the accommodation, the physical exercise that comes with it or the vitamin D. Now, all of this causes a release in the dopamine and causes scleral remodeling. So here they say that around 80 minutes of outdoor activities can inhibit uh, myopia progression by 30%. And the 6,300 lux of light density is good for the eyes. And uh, physical exercise augments and violet light also adds to it. Effect of near work is very good. They say that the odds of myopia increases 2% for every one diopter hour more of near work. And reading distance of less than 25 cent centimeters is worse. More than two hours daily is positively associated with myopia. Again, nutrition, the more obese the children, the more the uh, myopia. And they found recently that LED light has been found to have a higher prevalence of myopia than those using incandescent or fluorescent lights. Uh, children with lesser amount of sleep, uh, they have a higher odds ratio of uh, getting myopia than those who have more than nine hours of sleep. Now we come to the final part. What do we tell the parents? But really, it's not just the parents. It's a complete unity of several places because a child is exposed to several environments and all of this has to be taken care in order to uh, kind of start off with myopia advocacy. So when I talk about online classes, well, what I usually tell is visual hygiene. <laughs> Classes, bigger screens, bigger working distances, frequent blinking, sitting near a window, good ambient illumination, enlarged font size, 20-20-20 rule, good posture, and monitored outdoor breaks. We ask the parents to monitor their outdoor breaks. And in terms of lifestyle changes, we ensure the parent has to give them a daily proper routine. And with outdoor time, good physical activity, sleep, hydration, and a good diet. And of course, one should not lose out on psychological help where needed. So advocacy is very important. Prevention is always better. Talk to all the parents. And I always uh, uh, blindly tell all parents, irrespective of what condition they come for, from infancy right up to 15 years, I talk about outdoor time. Screen them early, as young as two years, three years, however soon you want to. 
make it very tailor made based on the age of the child the parental myopia early hyperopia demanding in school work children who have demanding school work and children who have poor access to outdoors so make it custom made uh, and also uh, having so to sum it up the myopia boom is definitely going to be amplified by covid scleral remodeling is the primary pathogenesis preventive advocacy is the way to go environmental factors are more impactful than genetics and customized myopia control is the future of this so thank you so much uh, dr uh, minakshi for giving me this opportunity and aioc for hosting this thank you thank you so much duti and again what a fantastic talk and uh, so no longer is myopia something that you can just write a pair of glasses and uh, tell the patient to be on their way there is so much time chair time that is going to be in the future there is going to be uh, genetics involved uh, questionnaire perhaps of all the activities environment outdoor this just it's going to be uh, it's exciting times ahead something for which we thought nothing can be done uh but this is a lot of scope a lot of scope uh in the future and once again thank you so much for a lovely talk mm. and uh, so uh we move on to the next topic which um is i am so glad that this topic is going to be presented by ms aparna gopalakrishnan she is from our uh, shankar yatralaya an optometrist and she's actually doing her phd in the area of myopia so no better person to talk about uh, the optical uh, corrections that is the orthokeratology spectacles and contact lenses for myopia control where do we go from now and so um, she's going to be speaking from my uh, system here so we're going to be loading this up in just a second over to you thank you ma'am uh, i just uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, dr minakshi for uh, giving me this forum and uh, ai was uh, to uh, let me speak in this uh, forum here thank you so much speak louder here i think wait you have to go here and do the forward okay yeah okay um so by now uh, we are all aware that uh, by 2050 half the world's population is uh, going to be uh, myopic and uh, there is an epidemic and uh, our uh, community work at shankar netralaya also showed that uh, one out of uh, four children at the age of 15 uh, in urban uh, cities are already myopic so this is proving that the predictions are really true and we are moving towards an epidemic of myopia so um, of course myopia is causing a lot of impact because of the economic burden that it is creating and uh, the um, risk that myopia carries itself with uh, it is at risk for various uh, um, other retinal complications uh, that can cause permanent visual impairment so uh, ideally we have to start uh, in terms of identifying uh, children who are at risk and trying to prevent myopia Uh, but uh, once myopia sets in there is a lot of uh, time for the eye to uh, elongate and um, for the eye uh, to get more myopia and so it's important for us to start thinking about myopia control strategies early so uh, if you look at myopia control strategies you can broadly divide them into pharmacological and optical and uh, i just want to uh, give a brief on various optical interventions that are now available and what the latest uh, evidence is telling you so uh, the very first optical intervention that was started about was bifocals and progressive addition lenses and the idea was that uh, myopes uh, the observation that myopes tend to uh, spend um, i mean uh, more time at near and uh, they also have a higher lag when compared to uh, the emetropes and this high lag is causing an hyperopic defocus at the fovea and this hyperopic defocus is a cue for axillary elongation so based on this there were a lot of trials on uh, bifocals as well as progressive addition lenses uh, but the results were not very uh, satisfactory my focus were giving contradictory results there were a lot of trials which showed that there was no significant difference between controls and uh, children with myopia except for a study by cheng et al where they had studied uh, children uh, giving um, executive bifocals 
um, alongside uh, a prismatic bifocal and they did find that around 50% of children were 50% uh, efficacy was there with uh, in terms of bifocal contact lenses, bifocal spectacles. But unfortunately, this study um, was not, these results were not replicated in other uh, studies. So the COMET study, which is the correction of myopia evaluation trial, uh, which was the longest uh, study, uh, which uh, looked at the efficacy of progressive addition lenses. And uh, they found that uh, there was a statistical significant difference between the controls and children who were prescribed with progressives, but uh, this significance was not really clinically significant. It was just a 0.25 diopters. And even that vanished after a period of five years. And they also found that it's a subgroup of children who have higher lag and near esophoria tend to uh, perform better with progressives. And there was a subsequent study that looked at only the subgroup of children who had higher lag and esophoria. But here again, the statistical significance was there, but uh, there was no clinical significance. So to, if you just look at all the studies that had looked at bifocals and uh, progressive addition lenses, except for the Cheng et al., which uh, the rest of the control strategies showed uh, close to 30%. So then um, uh, probably there was something else that was causing the uh, uh, myopia progression. So it uh, world moved into, uh, based on the animal studies, uh, it was found that when you do a myopia correction by traditional uh, concave lenses, uh, there is a peripheral hyperopic defocus that is created and probably the peripheral hyperopic defocus is the reason for uh, the axial elongation and myopia progression. And so subsequent designs were aimed to create peripheral, uh, to correct the peripheral hyperopic defocus or to create a myopic defocus at the periphery. So I'm just uh, listing few of the uh, commercially available multifocal spectacles that are showing promising results, although there are a lot of clinical trials with various designs going on now. One such uh, available uh, optical strategy is from my marketed by Zeiss, which is called the Myovision. Again, this is a central uh, distance zone uh, with a peripheral addition. This, um, the initial uh, two-year study period randomized control trial showed that the efficacy was around 30%. Uh, there was not much of clinically significant difference with this um, lens design. But the most promising one, which is just now arrived, is the um, defocus incorporated multifocal segment uh, technology lenses, which are now promoted as Myo Smart by Hoya, where it's essential uh, 9 mm is given for the distance uh, correction and uh, multiple lenslets surrounding the central uh, 9 mm around uh, 33 millimeter. Um, zone is creating a peripheral myopic defocus by incorporating a, a 3.5 diopter addition surrounding the central. And uh, the three-year uh, data has just uh, come out, which shows that uh, over a three-year period, the myopia progression was only 0.5 diopters uh, in the control, in the treatment group. And not only that, there was also a significant uh, efficacy noted in terms of axial growth. And uh, the problem that uh, this could cause some uh, peripheral blur, uh, which was also addressed in this study. And the study reported that the children had good complaints over the three year period and the adaptation to peripheral blur was also uh, was uh, accomplished within a few days. Not just that, um, even though the mean progression was 0.5 diopters at the end of three years, 70% of the children uh, did not uh, progress more than 0.25, which is really impressive. But uh, none of these lenses are currently available in India, but we might uh, hope that this is available in the coming years. Moving on to the soft contact lenses, similar to multifocal uh, bifocals, multifocal soft contact lenses also look into peripheral hyperopic defocus and try to induce myopic defocus or correct the peripheral hyperopic defocus in the periphery. One such lens is the MySight by Cooper Vision, which is the only lens that is actually approved by uh, FDA for myopia control. And uh, the efficacy is again impressive, similar to DIMS uh, technology lenses. Here, of, here also there is a 59% reduction at the end of three years uh, with children who are wearing MySight uh, contact lenses. And there is also an impressive uh, efficacy in terms of axial length control. Um, the other new design uh, that's now again in trials are the extended depth of focus lens designs where uh, they try to manipulate the higher order aberrations and uh, um, increase the depth of focus in the um, retina, thereby creating a myopic control. There, uh, these lenses are not yet commercially available, but the initial uh, trials are showing promising results and there is a 50% efficacy reported in the uh, control uh, trial 
result. But there are more trials that are ongoing and we will know about these lenses in a couple of years. Moving on to the next orthokeratology lenses, uh, which is uh, really old of all these uh, control strategies, which are uh, reverse geometry lenses that are worn overnight. And because of the lens design, there is a flattening at the co central cornea. And because of the mid peripheral zones, which are steep, uh, there is also a peripheral uh, myopic defocus and the hyperopic defocus is corrected. And that's how uh, this works as myopia control. Though there are not a not lot of RCTs available, uh, the reported RCTs show some amount of uh, uh, axial length reduction uh, of around 0.3 mm when compared to 0.6 in the control group. And a recent meta-analysis said that the main difference was around 0.28 between controls and ortho wearers. So uh, these are some of the orthokeratology lenses that are available in India. And most of the lenses are available up to minus uh, five and six, except for one. And it's important that we monitor myopia control in orthokeratology lenses. Uh, we can only monitor with in terms of axial length uh, elongation uh, instead of uh, than when compared to other uh, modes where we look at the fraction. Here it is important to um, document the axial length and monitor in terms of axial length growth. So um, of course there is risk with all myopia control strategies. We do not know how the rebound is uh, in all of these new uh, contact lens designs, though ortho -K is known to accelerate progression. And the other important factor to consider is the corneal infiltrates and infectious keratitis that are inherent with contact lens uh, mode of control. But uh, the rebound uh, strategy, uh, the rebound is really found in um, multifocal uh, spectacles or progressive addition lenses. Uh, the rebound is a concern in orthokeratology lenses. So spectacles are relatively safe and there is no adverse effects and you have to really uh, select the patient and uh, train and uh, give proper uh, lens care and maintenance instructions to the uh, children and parent and patient education is really important uh, when it comes to uh, contact lens uh, mode of control. So where do we go now? Of course, every diopter of control is going to improve the quality of life and we have to move from prescribing single vision lenses for managing myopia to start early with any of the control strategies that are available. Uh, there are also uh, combination technology techniques that are tried out and uh, it's a fast changing field and we need to be updated and follow the evidence-based practice. Thank you so much once again to Dr. Uh, MS Ma'am to, uh, to have given me the opportunity to be present here. Thank you. All right, let me just uh, stop sharing here. Um, yeah, you already saw stop sharing. Wonderful. All right. Um, so we are doing very good as in terms of uh, time. I think Dr. Uh, Ramesh is having some difficulty um, getting into the hall, despite uh, you know uh, you know sending him the link, etc. So I'm just working on that on the on the other side. Here now, I can see him, Ramesh. You can wave. Is I, there? I, oh, I okay. joined. I joined just ah, now. They, ah, they, I, I joined earlier, but they were not allowing me as a panelist. Panelist, that's right? Oh, that's okay. Good, good to see you. And nice, nice bright scrubs. You, you're brightening up the uh, screen here. Okay. All right, lovely. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, so, Ramesh, the the plan so far is we're just going through, uh, chugging along, finishing all the topics, so that uh, we will take the questions uh, later from the audience and uh, to each other. Uh, and so we are moving on. And uh, next is is uh, our Indian myopia hero. That's like that's how I want to call uh, Rohit, uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena, Professor, RP Center, um, and he is going to talk about here is my patient using the eye atom to guide stepwise approach to your patient with myopia. Over to you. Uh Thank you, Dr. Minakshi. Uh, my slide is visible? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. And of course, this discussion, which is rather important. Uh, I'll see if I can hide this, but I don't think I can. Anyway, so uh, uh, as Dr. Minakshi said, this was uh, about eye atom I'll be talking about, and of course, how we can incorporate what we've learned from the eye atom into our routine practice. The uh, eye atom 
uh, was the study which we conducted here. And thank you, Dr. Minakshi, uh, Shankar Netrale, Narayan Netrale, and Dr. Lipika also, who contributed to this study. It was a multicentric trial in which we had used low dose atropine uh, 0.01% to evaluate the effect on myopia progression in a randomized control group between the drug and a placebo. And we had about 100 patients. And uh, we realized that just like the atom and the lamp, uh, it was a pretty effective drug in the Indian population versus placebo. We found a 54% reduction in the mean spherical equivalent progression and a 21% reduction in the mean axial length reduction. Although the axial length reduction did not reach statistical significance, but there was definitely a little reduction as compared to uh, the placebo group. So while uh, one would say that the key intervention or the key desire for any myopia prevention should be axial length, preventing axial length elongation and not so much worry about the spherical equivalent progression. But we do see that that is a problem uh, that is being observed world over in any study done anywhere on the 0.01%. And as time goes by, probably we'll get a better dosage ethnic wise. So what was our patient selection and how these results are applicable to your clinical practice? So this would be applicable to this patient selection that we have used these results. However, we expect that these results should be applicable to patients outside this also, provided they fall into that same uh, broad window which we have included the patients. And so um, six to 14 year old children who showed a myopic progression of 0.5 diopters per year in the preceding one year. So at least 0.5 diopter progression of myop in the past one year, they got included. And that one would say is ideally the inclusion criteria that you should consider if you start uh, any form of myopia intervention. We used a spherical refractive error of minus one to minus six diopters, a low uh, astigmatism of 0.15, and inesometropia of, of one diopter. Best corrected visual acuity better than 612, and no other ocular pathology. Of course, before we enrolled and we started, patient and parent awareness about the risks of myopia were important. We help them to understand the risk profile, particularly parents being myopic. So both parents being myopic, three times the risk that the child will become myopic and become and progress. Inform alternatives or ways to avoid the risks that are there, uh, that, that are avoidable, that were talked so nicely by Dr. Shruti. Uh, inform about the expected efficacy and potential benefits of treatment, the risks and the possible side effects. And of course, the long-term results are as of now not available, but we hope that with time they would be available for the Indian population. So history, basic ocular examination, if everything normal, uh, a cycloplegic refraction to the axial length, other ocular parameters, and then if willing, enroll in the, the, into the myopia treatment program. So we asked the other questions that were required to know were when were the first time the child used glasses? How frequently has he, she required to change them? Any eye-related complaints? Uh, history of ocular general health, parental history of myopia about their onset, about their progression, uh, any other myopia control treatment, particularly yoga uh, and other methods that are prevalent have been reported uh, by some patients, known allergy to atropine or any drug, and of course, details about the child's screen work and the visual environment the child is in. The basic ocular examination included visual acuity, uh, ETDRS, but of course, on a routine, you could probably just follow up with Snellens, uh, distant corrected visual acuity, pupillary examination, slit lamp for anterior segment health, intraocular pressure, and fundus examination, particularly the center and periphery provided the child is willing and comfortable. A cycloblegic refraction, we used homide, oblique, tropicamide, anything is uh, doable, whatever is preferred in your uh, clinical practice. Uh, if you use the auto ref, use at least three readings and take a median. And of course, preferably to use an objective refraction in the way of retinoscopy and do a subjective refraction. The refraction methods should be repeatable acro acro across time. Uh, patients should be, the patients should be prescribed spectacles based on the current refraction and the tendency to undercorrect to give less than what they require should actually definitely be avoided. And of course, keep a document of the previous power of glasses that the child had or has been using.
Measure, measure other ocular parameters. The key parameter to measure is axial length, which uh, was unfortunately missed in many previous studies and works that have been done. So now, even in clinical practice, because the key outcome measure that one should actually look for or hope for is reduction in the axial length elongation. So axial length measurement using ultrasound biometry or an optical biometer, IL master or lens star, is not only now one would say optimal, but probably an essential part of myopia workup. Measure the amplitude of accommodation. Uh, also do a pupillometry, the baseline pupillometry and the effect after when you start the drug. So uh, we advised full-time use of correction corrected glasses. Uh, 0 0.01 atropine in the study we advised bedtime, although some studies have talked about a morning use. Uh, but clinically, it of course, is your decision where you prefer it. As of now, there is equivocal evidence of either. Monitor and report any adverse effects. Have a place where an emergency reporting can be possible. Encourage to develop healthy visual habits like spending time outdoors, reduce near demand. And of course, our first advice was to follow up after two weeks. And we feel that that may be an important follow up because of picking up an adverse effects. In fact, we had uh, one child in our center who actually lost the bottle we gave them and bought the bought a drug from uh, outside and actually got 1% atropine. And two weeks later, the child came limbus to limbus dilated. And we were very surprised. This was in the initial period of the study. And I was surprised at how 0 0.01 could have such an effect. But, you know, on examination, we realized. So it's important to establish the side effects, also a second baseline, because there may be a slight change in the refractive error because of the atropine. So uh, studies have shown that there may be a slight change in the baseline of the refractive error, so that when you're following up, you need to adjust for that second baseline. Of course, intraocular pressure, just to make sure that there is no increase in intraocular pressure. And of course, subsequent follow-ups can depend upon your clinical practice. This was our follow-up uh, up to one year in our study and subsequently we're following up at half yearly intervals but this two-month follow-up can be avoided in clinical practice so a baseline examination may do a complete examination at two weeks you do the visual equity assessment and intraocular uh, assessment and see for any side effects that may may not be there the two months like i said may be optional in your clinical practice at six months you need to see them once and then at one year again at one year you need to see uh, the child and see how much impact the drug has made because this is a time when decision can be made whether this child is a is a good responder an average responder or a poor responder because it may affect your long term or your planning for the subsequent treatment if the child appears to be doing well you can continue uh, the treatment and follow up again after 6 months and then after 2 years the aim of the study was to stop atropine at two years and then follow up for a washout period. Again, the importance to uh, see the child at two years, again, to assess the efficacy of the treatment that you have given. Take a call in discussion with the parents about weaning off or uh, slowly stopping the child from atropine. But the key is to ask them to continue follow up because you want to pick up for the rebound phenomena. So the, these are uh, our planned uh, investigation in the children, but like I said, in a clinical practice, you could see differently. In terms of myopia progression, change in spherical equivalent is important, but change in axial length is also extremely important. Take a decision on management. And of course, look for change in other parameters if you can, particularly pupil size and amplitude of accommodation. Treatment can be stopped or changed if the progression is not sufficiently controlled. There is poor tolerance or compliance or safety issues are an issue. Uh, a washout after you stop the atropine, a three month follow up period visit is important so that you can again record how the child is doing, how the parameters are there. And of course, to discuss that the child continues to follow up and make sure that there is no rebound in these children. So it's important to have a good patient selection, educate and communicate with the patient parents about the benefits and the risk of any myopia control program that you enroll the child in. Perform basic examination, cycloplegic refraction, and if found fit, prescribe atropine drops at the low dose. Maintain and follow up at the scheduled time and analyze change in refractive error and axial length to plan for clinical management. Thank you very much for the opportunity.
Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Minakshi. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rohit. I think every, every word you uttered was, uh, was so important in managing these patients. And I know it's a continuing, continuous learning process uh, and we need to keep be changing our strategies and tweaking things as we go along. But it's very important to have some standards, uh, standard of care as well. And I think you very beautifully summarized um, uh, wonderful. So I think we're, we'll uh, move on to the next talk, uh, which is, you know, we all come across these situations when we are very dogmatic about how we know to manage our patients. Along will come a patient that will completely stump us. So we have so many out of the box situations and thinking that have to happen in myopia. So um, uh, this uh, is Dr. Sumita Agarkar, Deputy Director of Pediatric Ophthalmology, my colleague and friend of many years. And I've, uh, you know, she's going to be giving a beautiful talk on thinking outside the box, how to manage myopia in difficult situations. Thank you, Dr. Sumita. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay. So, uh... I'm going to, as she said, I'm going to take a little bit of devil's advocate here and actually tell you where exactly probably myopia prevention or myopia intervention is probably not as such a established because there is little evidence for these situations. So, uh, several speakers before me have actually talked about this. Uh, this and I is probably will not go over it. Everybody probably feels that this is, everybody knows that this is uh, uh, economic burden which is coming in years. Uh, and numbers are frightening. This is 2015 data for India where the prevalence has gone to 13.1% and the school studies which were done around Chennai, if it will look at the private schools, it is actually approaching around 18 to 19% from Shankanetrale data of school screenings. Uh, and if you go to really private school, affluent children are there, it is already approaching 25%. So probably interventions are required and we need to look at various interventions which are already being described by several eloquent speakers before me. Uh, so, these are basically where we are dealing with at this point where we have some evidence uh, that these interventions work. So the, at the point, probably only these three, which show a really promising uh, thing. But the situation what we, which we don't know about, uh, uh, or we are not really sure where atropine has a role or where DIMS has a role is probably these. These are, uh, when I, was looking at a complex situation where we don't know that we don't have enough evidence. Probably these are the these are the situations where we are actually don't have clear cut answers on what to do for these these children. Of course, allergy to the atropine is something which uh, you really cannot uh, uh, predict, and uh, the commonest symptoms will be these. And however, none of the serious uh, studies have reported any serious side effects with atropine, especially with 0.01%, which is the most commonly used pres uh, prescription. But probably it, you have to really be a little bit aware where uh, children have Down syndrome and they can have exaggerated mediatic and cycloplegic response. Uh, children who are asthmatic can actually be worsen because of the thickening of secretions and dryness of the airways, which is caused by atropine. And these children probably need to, you need to monitor or be careful about prescribing without getting a pediatric uh, opinion about it. Again, children who are anti-mascarinic medications, such as like some antihistaminics, also can have additive effect with topical medication. So probably you need to speak to pediatricians uh, before uh, starting atropine in these uh, certain situations. Again, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Rohit mentioned that uh, 0 0.01 to 1% is a very common mistake and a lot of times it is very important to probably show their parents how to administer that only one drop is sufficient as well as that uh, to look for the pers correct percentage when you are giving uh, children atropine. Now non-responders is also one complex situation where there are no clear cut uh, evidence on what is to be done. So both the strategies of increasing the frequency, like instead of one, maybe twice a day, or increasing the strength, 
from 0.01 to 0.02 or 0.05 seems to be reasonable but at the moment there is no there is no evidence uh, there is no clear evidence or no patient no there has been no comparative studies done for looking at these two groups who are, who are considered as so called non responders uh, and non responders can be as high as uh, 15 to 16% so which is a fairly good number if you look at the numbers of children who have myopia in our country uh, sn study which had a small number also reported 16% who were non responders so probably in these patients uh, however there is some lamp study does come up with some evidence that if you increase the frequency if you increase the strength of the drop it probably is going to be more effective so that's one option which is coming up but if after 2 years progression is still continuing then probably you need to look at other options like uh, combined interventions or uh, some other technology like dims now we don't know whether atropine is effective in ocular comorbidities sometimes high myopia is not because of the axial length increase but because of the coexisting ocular comorbidities like subluxated lenses microspherophakia keratoconus juvenile glaucoma they all present sometimes with progressive myopia a careful examination anterior segment examination should rule out these conditions and there is really no big diagnostic dilemma in this but obviously they are not the right candidates for low dose atropine or other myopia uh, interventions which have been discussed earlier syndromic or very high myopia or pathological myopia like marfan's or retinal dystrophies sometimes come the initial symptoms in children are often nothing else except myopia and these are generally non progressive and role of atropine is not clear in these conditions these conditions were have not been studied and were probably were excluded from most of the studies which have been published in the literature and these children can often present with high myopia and there is a temptation to prescribe atropine or other interventions in these children but probably it is a uh, sensible to look for more evidence before starting atropine or any other intervention for that matter in these this particular subset of patients very young children or pre myopes again atom 3 is looking at the effect of atropine but again looking at the genetic history shruti has very uh, uh, very eloquently mentioned that risk of uh, myopia does go up if both the parents are myopia so there is sometimes pressure from the parents as well as uh, from the evidence also that to start uh, atropine in very young children to prevent myopia but again uh, probably jury is still out on this ki whether you should really start uh, atropine in these or atropine or any other interventions to offset the uh, onset of myopia thank you for your attention thank you Thank you, Samita, for the nice uh, presentation. I, uh, I just yeah. uh, go ahead. I might have missed one slide, but there is a little bit of uh, no uh, restriction. I should have mentioned, or I don't know whether that slide was missing. But pseudo fakes or the children who become myopic also probably fall into this category where there is very little evidence, except some anecdotal evidence that it works. Only uh, confounder in that will be again glaucoma. which can uh, present as increasingly high myopia so probably the practitioner should be careful uh, in prescribing myopia interventional strategies because it's the temptation to start atropine and pseudo pseudo fix is also uh, pressure is from the parents that and technically speaking it should probably work if it is work on the axial length then uh, scientifically or rationally it should work in pseudo fix children also but only thing you have to be careful about is glaucoma and uh, probably um, that needs to be ruled out before you start any intervention thank you okay lovely thank you and you fell finished well uh, before time and uh, wonderful thank you uh, and we've been to take up a lot of these things for discussion and uh, before i proceed to the last talk i want to properly introduce 
Dr. Ramesh, who uh, joined us. I'm so happy you're on the panel with us. Dr. Ramesh heads the uh, pediatric ophthalmology at LV Prasad. He's a household name in uh, global pediatric ophthalmology, one of the founder members of the WSPOS. I am very excited and very happy for you to be with us on this session. Thank you, Ramesh. I know you're busy with theater, but you've still made time for us, and this is wonderful. And um, so we move on to the aptly titled last talk, uh, which is Future is Ours. And Dr. Jitendra Jatani, who's holding uh, the fort in the Western India, who is again um, known for his practice of evidence-based medicine, who has shown that you can do high quality research in a private practice. And uh, so he's gonna share with us, what does the future hold for control of myopia? Thank you so much, Dr. Jitendra. And uh, just before you start with Dr. Jitendra, I would just uh, like to uh, inform our chairperson and moderator. We have uh, two questions in the question and answer uh, department, right? So I, after, I, I, did, I did see that, but I just thought we have discussed. After we finish this discussion, then we can address that. We'll do that. Thank you so much. I, I took the privilege and answered one of them. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, ma'am. And it is an absolute pleasure to be uh, part of uh, this uh, wonderful uh, uh, symposium, uh, mainly because uh, I feel that it is uh, the right time to uh, have this as an important aspect in uh, childhood blindness, and uh, I would be presenting some of uh, some of them will be repetitions. This is all uh, repetitions. I will skip those slides. We have discussed this uh, at length. Uh, all this uh, has been discussed. Uh, just a small point that uh, near birth outdoor exposures and myopia in children is now a very well-known accepted fact that there is a close association between near work and myopia. And uh, so these are uh, some of the uh, things. And uh, so I would be showing some of the work which we have done. And uh, because uh, in prior practice, we don't have huge numbers, I would really love to see uh, bigger uh, studies in these groups. And so this was, uh, this was a study in which we did on pre-myopes. And uh, the future uh, is obviously to start uh, thinking about uh, stopping the progression in pre-myopes because uh, that would be the that would be the next go-to uh, go-to goal of all of us uh, to prevent the progression and to try to uh, you know reduce it before it actually becomes a menace. So this was uh, this was a, a not a very big number, but uh, we. We tried to compare uh, two groups, children who were suggested to use atropine and uh, did not use it, and children who we could uh, convince them uh, and they started using low concentration atropine. We found that, you know, uh, so these pre myops were basically children who were already on follow up with us and uh, were either uh, small uh, hypermetropes, 0.5 after spherical, and then went into becoming uh, myopes or became emetrope. And we uh, started measuring axial lengths uh, almost six to eight years back. Uh, since we started using low concentration atropine, we made it a point to start uh, measuring axial length in uh, the susceptible group. And we found that uh, this was quite a, quite an interesting thing that you, you, know, you can start them quite early when you, when you have sufficient data to suggest that they would be progressing. So that is that is one thing. This is uh, just from the, the data which has already been published. I, I entirely uh, enjoy sharing this particular publications from Andres uh, on uh, the risk factors. This is, uh, I discuss it a lot. This all we have uh, discussed. And uh, so we will, this is an important slide because I, I think there was a wonderful, wonderful talk by Dr. Nina on uh, the comparison of lamp and atom. I think that uh, ATOM study, ATOM 2 uh, especially, uh, clearly said that it was a concentration dependent response. Although LAMP uh, study mentioned that ATOM 2 did not suggest that, ATOM 2 clearly suggests that it was indeed a dose dependent response, just that the, uh, the results were not significantly different. Optimal concentration is what the future holds. We don't know what is the optimal concentration despite LAMP 2 study 
suggesting that 0.05% is a wonderful combi, wonderful concentration. We don't know whether 0 0.06 will be better than 0 0.05 or not. So this is, you know, this, this is like 0 0.05 has been halved to 0 0.025, which has been halved to 0 0.01 and compared. So there is there is no uh, there is no uh, clinical uh, or rather there is no scientific uh, thought process that as to how they came to this conclusion. Why they came to this conclusion? Because they have doubled it and used it, which is a wonderful thing, because now we know that 0 0.05 works better than 0 0.01. But the, the whole problem here is that we don't have a biomarker. We don't have a biomarker which can simply tell us quickly that this particular uh, drop is working at, in a short period of time. All, all our work, we have to wait for a year, two years, washout period. So it takes a couple of years before we are sure that this particular thing is working. Where does all this leads us to? All this leads us to the fact that atropine eye drops do reduce the progression of myopia, whether we should give it in pre-myops or not. We still have to wait. Whether it is, uh, which concentration would be wonderful to begin with 0.01%, but would increase in concentration in non-responders, would they respond? We don't know whether they would respond to twice a day. Uh, some of them may respond. How much would be the compliance? This is our own study where we found that almost 14% did not comply. Again, very small sample size. Uh, this was for pre myops which I already shared. This was a study which we uh, started doing when LAMP1 uh, came and we tried to find out whether single versus twice a day would be better or not. Twice a day indeed is better than uh, once a day with uh, no significant increase in side effects. Uh, and whether non-responders, whether we can increase the concent uh, the uh, BID dosage and we found that almost 30% of children did respond, respond to uh, you know increasing the frequency, but almost 70% still did not respond. Now we have started them on 0.05%. We are still waiting whether that would they would respond or not. And uh, so this was this is another uh, another uh, work we where we were, we were already having patients who were not using atropine and progressing slowly since uh, 2018 2019. And we found that there was a huge jump in their uh, uh, average growth and even in their myopia, uh, especially during lockdown period. And uh, this, uh, uh, this is uh, what uh, uh, Sumita Madam was uh, saying. We had our own small work where we found that it is indeed useful. Uh, and I, I think we are those anecdotal experiences. We have just uh, uh, seven uh, patients where we found that uh, we tried to use low concentration atropine. And this was in 2019 when we looked into the data of those seven children. Uh, it works for uh, pseudophagic uh, children as well. Um, and uh, what are the future areas of research? Tremendous. So first and foremost is whether there can be other drugs. So way back in 2000, I think 12 or 13, there was a paper from uh, Denmark where, we, where they, they have studied the usage of 7-methylxanthine. Uh, unfortunately, it is not available in India. And so uh, they, they have done a two-year study and found that 7-methylxanthine was indeed a good drug and that also retarded the progression. Uh, we are in search uh, of biomarkers, uh, dopamine being one of them, whether there are any other biomarkers which can help us uh, find out uh, quickly which particular patient would be uh, responding to low concentration atrophy and whether the increase and decrease in that particular biomarker would be able to tell us uh, that uh, this patient uh, is having a good effect of atropine or any other drug for that matter. <clears throat> concentrations, uh, concentrations are at large. I mean, there is 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.05. And uh, we will be seeing more and more work in uh, uh, permutation and combinations. Uh, till that time, we have got 0.01% at this point of time in India. Now it is DGCI approved, so good for us, but uh, we will have to hold our breath there. Uh, other interventions, uh, you know, there are, there are plenty of uh, different type of aspheric glasses which came five years back, and another one came with a, with a theory of uh, myopic defocus, hyperopic defocus, and uh, myosmart glasses are there. Highly aspheric lens -like target designs are there. I have not used uh, both of them, and so I have no idea. But yes, the future uh, does uh, hold uh, promise there. Uh, modified schools, whether we can, if, if at all, 
uh, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, take this opportunity of this forum and like to ask for a national program for prevention of myopia progression. And if that happens, there could be modified schools, modified education system that holds the future because if at all, if, if the progression is going to be 40 to 50% incidence, then we need to think of it at this point of time. Physical in infrastructure changes, lifestyle modifications, which have been aptly discussed, and whether those modifications can be incorporated in the sensitive time and sensitive period of children, whether we can go back to group training or whether we can the walls of the and every 20 minutes we can take uh, takes a lot of time to understand whether this particular intervention is working or not. So I will come back to the most important thing which is in demand is search for biomarkers which we need quickly so that we can do more and more work and quantify whether this particular intervention is indeed working or not. So thank you so much for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak on uh, this particular talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chitendra. I don't know. I just had this gut feeling when we planned this uh, uh, symposium that nobody will do a, a better job than you uh, on, on this topic. And uh, you, have, you have proved me right. And uh, so wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, there are um, some questions. And um, let me see if we can start um, with the top one, uh, which just says, which is addressed to Dr. Rohit. Uh, Dr. Rohit, you said, and this is from Dr. Rajesh Prabhu, it says, you said the age group is 6 to 14. Uh, do you stop the atropin at the end of two years, irrespective of age of starting? So is, is what is the practice? I guess that's what he's asking. So uh, what I discussed was about the study, where we stopped and looked for the washout and uh, the rebound. Uh, but in clinical practice also, I would... Uh, uh, unless a child is very young and we are seeing that the child is at very high risk of progression, uh, I would discuss with the parents, have them off the drug for a period of a year to see for the washout effect and see whether there is uh, a rebound or a repeat of uh, the rapid progression because uh, Frankly, at the moment, there is no evidence of any endpoint. So we just start saying that, you know, early teens or mid-teens, we'll stop the drug. But we know some patients even progress till 17 or 18. So it's at the moment a matter of trial and error. But yes, at the moment, even in clinical practice, I stop them at two years, see for a washout period. But if they rebound or if they have uh, a repeat of the uh, progression, which is much higher than what it was during their period of treatment, I discuss with them and restart them on atropine. But I think it's important to know how the child would do. Probably he may just have leveled off and uh, you need not continue the drug for an indefinite period of time. Okay, so uh, thank you. And the next question, and I'm going to request uh, Dr. Sumita to answer this because I think you had a publication on ROP and myopia. Uh, so this is from Dr. Savleen, uh, who compliments uh, uh, all of you on the presentations and asks about ROP associated myopia. She, it's just a point she's making. Uh, because she says atropine should be avoided because the myopia is not really axial. Would you like to comment about this, Dr. Sumita? Yeah, I think there is now a lot of uh, studies with uh, anterior segment parameters which have come with myopia and that looks like most of the myopia in uh, ROP is probably related to the lens thickness, lens power increase and uh, not so much with the axial uh, elongation. So probably uh, myopia I'm not sure whether we should start atropine. A lot of these children often have very, very high myopia to start with, but it does not progress that much. That is my, again, anecdotal evidence, which I feel. But a lot of them do not progress the way other myopia does. And uh, there is more and more evidence, which uh, it seems to suggest that it is the cornea and uh, lens power, effective lens power, or which is... Uh, which is responsible for my opinion these two. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Uh, Sushant Gopal, and I'm going to uh, request uh, Dr. Ramesh to uh, take this up. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, atropin use in congenital myopia? Uh, is it effective at all? Or if it is, how effective? What are your thoughts? Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Menakshi, for having me. Uh, I, I think. Uh, 
most of it is covered uh, by the speakers what i would say is if uh, there is a short answer i would say at this point of time no because the the change in the connective tissue profile due to the genetic mutation congenital myopia usually happens in stickler and other uh, kind of uh, situations we are not able to modify the connective tissues at this point of time it applies to even uh, marfan syndrome it uh, uh, it's the same for even uh, microspherophakia all the situations it's uh, similar when you when it happens to myopia i think there is an explosion of myopia incidence but there is an explosion of myopia research as well we we are getting each day at least there are 10 reports saying that this is there vitamin d all that is coming most of the things what we are looking at there are many many confounders with the pandemic most of us are indoors uh, that is the biggest confounder here so I would say it does not work. What we have to do is more and more research. Most of the answers are not available, as uh, Sumita said, whether it works in prematures, ROPs. Uh, many times people ask me whether it works in anisometropic amblyopia, zero in one eye, and the other eye is minus eight. But people have even started uh, low-dose atropin. So unless we measure, monitor myopia, there are three Ms which are important. Measure, monitor, and the myopia, and do publish this. We will not be. It's like a, a vaccine for COVID. All of us have to work towards it to find out what is best in terms of uh, you know this prevention. Mm. Well said. The 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 three M company is going to like you for the <laughs> the three Ms. I like that. Nice. Thank you, uh, Ramesh. Um, uh, okay, this question I'm going to have uh, Dr. Meena answer. So this is again a question from Dr. Santan Gopal. So it says, what do you do if myopia progresses on atropine? So what is, uh, what is your uh, approach, Dr. Meena? If they continue to progress on atropine 0.01%, what do you do in your practice? Uh, yes, ma'am. So uh, actually, we also did a small study at our center looking at uh, the effect of low-dose atropine. And uh, as the ATOM study also pointed out, uh, I usually wait for two years. Like uh, at the end of two years, we evaluate the myopia progression. Suppose if it's progressing uh, very rapidly, that is, let's say, more than 0.75 diopters per year, then, of course, uh, after, after two years of low-dose atropine, then of course I have to look at uh, other treat. I mean, either I would uh, counsel them to uh, increase the uh, frequency of the low dose atropine from point not of point not one, which is the only concentration which is available right now, to a twice daily dosage, or even as jo uh, Dr. Jason Yam suggested during the last POSI me meeting that you could uh, ask them to use two drops at bedtime to avoid the morning, uh, you know, side effect of atropine. So these are the two. Uh, uh, modalities which I'm currently working on it and I don't have any uh, large-scale data to uh, tell you the effect but we will know in due course of time and uh, so these are the suggestions that you can give them and along with uh, working on the lifestyle modifications like reducing the near work and uh, you know increasing the outdoor time if possible but if suppose if the child is within six months or one year of a low dose atropine I would tell them to hold on and uh, look for the effect by the end of two years. So, and suppose after uh, two years also, if the progression is mild and the child is, uh, you know, if the mild and child is uh, reached teens, you could stop it. But if it's moderate, you could continue it for another two more years. If the, after stopping the drug, if there is uh, no rebound, you could continue for two more years and see till the child becomes uh, late teens. Okay. That's what we are planning to do. Okay. Um, would you want to weigh in on this, Dr. Rohit? Do you have a different approach? Uh, so I would say that if uh, uh, at one year, and now clinical practice, of course, away from the study, if at one year we see, compared to the first year, we see significant progression and it has not slowed down by the drug, I would say that the alternatives should be explored either an add-on or else could discuss with the patient about a higher dose. And we had tried higher dose in some patients. I mean, at that time, of course, we hadn't used 0 0.05. We were using 0 0.1 uh, made from our pharmacy. So again, uh, and we realized that that almost, you know, about 20 to 30% children would continue to progress in a significant manner 
despite your low dose atropine. So I guess as as it is, we still don't know the appropriate dose, and it may be actually ethnically different. So it may be what is different for us may be different for East Asia and may be different from the Europe. So maybe we have to identify uh, within the ethnicity also our subgroups which are performing worse. So you may have to up the dose or as Jitendra said, give it BD or something. So uh, you need to look at, you know, alternatives because we still don't know how we, I mean, as Jitendra said, we don't know how we came to 0 0.01. So what is the most effective ethnically or within one group, uh, those who respond better or worse is... Uh, you know, kind of still evolving. Okay. Okay. A lot to think about. I agree. And, and uh, Dr. Ramesh, I think, wants to make a point. I just uh, wanted to ask five rapid fire questions to the panelist. Is it yeah. possible? Yes, of course. Okay. I just want to ask because these are the most common questions asked by uh, to me in many of the conferences. When concentration fails, what do you do, Jitendra? 0 0.01 fails. What's your next approach? So to, begin with, so to begin with, what I do is I make it now. I am giving it twice a day. And if that fails, I start reconstituting and make 0 0.05. Rohit? Uh, I love the concentration. And uh, uh, 0.1 is what I have tried because I feel that uh, you, know, you need to have a significant dose. Shruti? Yeah, uh, initially I used to shift to morning dose uh, and then go for the day, uh, twice a day dose. But now I also shift to twice a day. I also look for compliance because that is one thing which we somehow miss. And sometimes when they are not compliant with the medications, they tend to uh, have progression. Most of the cases, they kind of stabilize. So uh, I go with daily, uh, twice a day dosing if it doesn't work. So. Sumita? Uh, I give twice a day. And sometimes talk to them about other interventions also, like okay. contact lenses and stuff like that. Okay, that that we are, we will come to it. Nina, yes, I said I would shift to either two drops uh, at bedtime, or uh, give. I mean, I'm currently comparing the both the uh, therapy therapeutic options: two drops at bedtime of 0.01 percent, or twice daily of 0.01 percent. So I don't have 0.05 available. So that would be my best, better option. But currently, I'm doing these two things. Okay. I have a related question. How long do you wait before you up the dose? Uh, this is a question from Six Savi, months. specifically to Jitendra. Six months, ma'am. Six, Six months. months. Okay. One year. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Ju just to summarize, when uh, concentration fails, there is an option of making it two times a day. Before that, please check compliance. This is the suggestion by the group. Please check compliance or make it BD. Rohit also is suggesting, think about increasing the concentration. Dr. Meenakshi, you can summarize if there is any difference from uh, what we discussed at this point of time. No, I'm, I'm with you. Please continue. Okay. <laughs> okay, I had the second question. When drop fails altogether, what is your next option? Rohit, I'll start with you. When drop so, completely fails, what is your option? So not much uh, experience. I mean, of course, add on uh, the environmental modifications and all. But if that draw, uh, drop fails, not enough experience on ortho K, but we've had a couple of patients in ortho K, but compliance issues are really bad. So not much experience on that. Uh, Sumita? Anything to add? Uh, we have just started ortho -K in our hospital. So I do talk about it, but uh, it's prohibitively expensive lenses. Honestly, to tell you the truth, very few people are able to afford them. And even if you afford them, you are always worried about adverse events of nighttime lens wear. So yeah, at the moment, if the patients cannot afford, I tell them to live with it. That's it. Okay. Shruti, any difference? or anything else? Uh, I, I do a BV evaluation uh, surface in these patients because sometimes they tend to have a lag of accommodation in which we address them. I've given vision therapy for a couple of them, but I, I don't stop the atropine. I mean, I, I don't stop them. I keep them on it and then I do the vision therapy and sometimes they do respond to that as well. Nina, uh, thank you. I wanted, I wanted to add that we do a BV evaluation as a baseline for all uh, patients. Okay. I'll come to you, Dr. Meenakshi, to summarize each of this question. You are the final authority to... I am not you know, the authority. Tell. <laughs> okay. I am, the, I am also on the panel. I'm not the authority. <laughs> Give me all this. Dr. Meena. 
Uh, uh, we are actually currently exploring the ortho key option, but we don't have right now. I, I, again, um, I don't have any anything else uh, right now uh, as of now. Okay, Jitendra, anything else to add? I have just started two children on uh, halt lenses. We just imported them from Europe for them. Again, very expensive, as Sumitha Madam said. They were affording people, and uh, atropine is working, but not working as much as uh, you know. It, it they still fall into moderate uh, kind of people. So I've told them that uh, these Mayo uh, smart lenses are there, and they've ordered two of them. They've not come back. It has been just uh, twenty days. We do okay. expect uh, request the doctors to summarize it now. That's uh, that's it. <laughs> okay. We, we... Then I, I must say I should stop Three here. More questions by Ramesh. Okay, it it just Three that questions. I had, I thought it's still one o'clock. Uh, if it is, we have to close it. I think uh, when the when the drop fails, uh, we have options. Uh, here we are trying, uh, especially when it fails, and also in older age group ortho K lenses, we are trying to make it indigenous as well, uh, so that it will be available for all. Uh, we will just come out with uh, some data. Otherwise, uh, I will go up till one percent and then uh, then ask them to continue. I will still not give up the drops. That's what uh, I would still do it because I, I I can't stop it. But I will say still carry on because the rebound effect is much more there. So I would still uh, ask them to hold on. Uh, one of the one of the thing is that. Uh, Nature as well as the screen time, they'll say it works. I think once it progresses to that stage, these things uh, cannot really reverse this. That's one of the advice. It's not that I'll ask the child to now you can play anytime with the screen. No, we will not do that. But still, at that point of time, your uh, nature modalities uh, does not work. I think it works best in pre -myops. If time is up, uh, I will withdraw. Yeah, wonderful, other wonderful, wonderful thoughts. And uh, as you know, this this hot topic. It, it just keeps getting hotter. And so I apologize for the others uh, who uh, we couldn't take up a couple of questions. Please come back to us on our kids group, and we'll continue this discussion. I thank uh, Ramesh, uh, Rohit, Nina, Shruti, Sumita, Jitendra, each and and Aparna, each and every one of you have shared your time and knowledge to make this session uh, a success. A request particularly to, uh, to Rohit, who is, I think, still a part of ARC, to see if you can come up with uh, the idea that Jitendra floated about having a national consensus or that we can share with the schools to limit uh, the, uh, to give breaks, to increase uh, environmental exposure, to limit screen time, etc. cetera. Um, it's my humble request to you. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Hime, the HAL coordinator. You've been uh, uh, an excellent support and I thank each and every one of you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bye -bye. Thank you to all the doctors. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.